the spanning internal fixator is an important tool that may be applied to a small proportion of distal radius fractures. Its indications for use are not dissimilar to those for the external fixator. For unreconstructable articular surfaces, the use of traction and ligament ataxis can improve the overall alignment of the fracture. It's important to remember that it will not be able to mobilize die punched or completely dissociated fragments, much as in the same way with an external fixator. This traction can be applied and maintained over a long period of time with an internal spanning plate. One of the benefits of using a plate is that mechanically it's far more stable and solid, as it doesn't have as much of a cantilever force due to the distance of the external fixator bars from the bone. The distance from the plate from the bone is much, much smaller, giving you a more stable, solid construct. Complex radiocarpal dislocations or fracture dislocations often involve very small bony injuries. These can be incredibly challenging to try and fix directly by open reduction internal fixation techniques. Therefore, the use of an internal spanning fixator allows the fracture to be aligned when the wrist is reduced and held in position long enough for the bone or ligaments to heal via secondary intention. In the polytraumatized patient, it's always important to remember that the wrist injury is likely to be one of the least important elements of their care. The trauma resuscitation is key and in those scenarios, damage control orthopedics must come into play, i.e. rapid stabilization of an injured limb to allow rapid soft tissue resuscitation. The internal spanning plate can be used in these scenarios, but it's important to remember that there must be adequate soft tissue coverage of the injured area to allow the skin to be closed over the plate. One important advantage over the external fixator is that pin site care is not required. And also in the patient with head injuries and varying levels of consciousness, there's no concern that external fixator pins may cause secondary trauma to the patient. In older patients with osteoporotic bone, there can be challenges with trying to fix comminuted fractures with enough stability to allow movement. With weak and soft bone, the hold of conventional plates and screws can be suboptimal, leading to secondary displacement despite attempts at rigid fixation. By using an internal spanning plate, the zone of injury can be bypassed and much better quality bone in the metacarpal and in the radius can be relied upon to provide stability and allow fractures to heal by secondary intention. The overall aim of spanning internal plates is to bypass the zone of injury with your fixation and allow traction and ligament ataxis to improve the overall alignment. The plate may be inserted to provide stability long enough for the injury to heal. The plate can be placed on the radius and span to either the index or the middle finger metacarpal. Index marked in blue here, middle marked in red. Note that both of them require exposure of the interval between APL and EPB and the ECRL and ECRB tendons for exposure to the radius. The benefits of using the index metacarpal are that it can adequately buttress displaced scaphoid facet fragments and also it can avoid irritating the EPL tendon, which can sometimes occur when using the middle finger metacarpal. The bonus of using the middle finger metacarpal placement is that it can buttress the dorsal fragments of the lunate fossa much better and also avoids potential risk of injuring more branches of the superficial radial nerve, which are more commonly found over the back of the index finger metacarpal. The setup is as shown here, supine on an arm table with a high arm tourniquet. The surgeon sits at the head end of the patient to allow easy access to the dorsal aspect of the hand and forearm, and image intensifier can be either brought in from the lateral aspect or from the foot of the patient. This example shows one particular brand of plate, but there are numerous different types available. In addition, one can use standard DCP or recon plates of adequate length and size, should there be no alternative. First, the length of the plate is marked to ensure that it's adequate. The metacarpal incision is made. Care is taken not to injure any superficial nerve branches. Dissection is continued deeper to the shaft of the metacarpal, which is sharply incised and dissected. On the forearm, on the dorsoradial aspect, an incision is made and the thumb extensor tendons are mobilized, defining the interval between them and the ECRB and ECR tendons. This takes you directly down onto the shaft of the radius, and from there, blunt dissection 
can be performed over the wrist joint towards the metacarpal. Reciprocating movement from metacarpal end can also be carried out. An elevator is often used to define the path of the plate before the plate is inserted. Depending on the overall fracture configuration, this can be done from a predominantly proximal to distal direction or a distal to proximal direction to avoid the plate being introduced into the fracture site. Once the plate has been positioned through the soft tissue envelope, radiographs can be formed to ensure that placement is adequate. Next, care is taken to ensure the plate is central on the metacarpal before being secured with a non-locking screw. This seats the plate well to the metacarpal and the same can be done on the shaft of the radius. Position can once again be checked with fluoroscopy. Once all is adequate and sufficient traction is performed, locking screws can be used to stabilize proximally and distally and radiographs taken to check the desired effect has occurred. Postoperatively, early mobilization is key. The use of a spanning plate will allow early hand, forearm and elbow mobilization. You may consider splintage alongside your plating, especially in areas where there's a significant bony defect, therefore a long working length of the plate. The longer you wish to keep your plate in, the more likely it is that eventually it will loosen if the underlying bone does not heal. We normally consider plate removal from around the three month mark. Consider radiological follow-up just to ensure there's no sign of loosening early, especially with overzealous patients that may be doing quite a lot with their arm, despite the fact that the plate is still in situ. Top tips to try and improve your outcome and expedite surgery involve ensuring that you judiciously elevate soft tissues using your periosteal elevator. Try not to strip too much. This will allow the plate to follow a predestined course and help with accurate placement. Always check the plate length before you start to ensure that it's sufficient enough to bypass the zone of injury required. It's important to ensure that you have at least three screws proximally and three screws distally to give enough stability to your construct. My preferred technique is to actually secure the plate to the metacarpal first fully with all its screws. And then once that is secured, to apply traction before then securing to the radius. This can be a very powerful way of adding traction to your construct. One must make sure they do not apply excessive traction, as this will give us some of the downsides seen with external fixators, such as tight tendons and CRPS secondary to median nerve problems. Key to success with these cases is early hand therapy. Thank you for listening.